No, I'm, I'm waiting to figure out where she's coming from. The voice is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody out there in Facebook land. Woo! My Facebook second, land. My second uh, interview of the day. I could do these all day long. This is so much fun. Today I'm speaking to a very, very good friend of mine, Richard Saunders. And through the miracles and amazement of technology brought to us by boomers. Boomers. <laughs> They're boomers. They I'm brought not a us boomer. this wonderful uh, ability to be able to use, be live in two different parts of the hemispheres in the in the northern sky area, in the, in the summer, this, whatever. Australia, Sydney, Australia. Richard That's Saunders it. and Susan Gerbic in Salinas, California. California. It's amazing. It's amazing. Hello, Susan. And nice it's to see you. Easy, easy. I can hear yeah. you and everything. This is also Great. being recorded <laughs> to our YouTube channel, YouTube um, for About Time Presents. If you'd like to check out the video later, it'll be there. Or... You know, a lot of people are finding the YouTube videos and all they're doing is watching the YouTube videos. They're not participating in the live feed. But whatever, it's fun. It looks like we are, at least have one person here now. <laughs> it's fun. That's more than we could hope for. One person. Hello. Thank in you New for Jersey. watching. It's Rob Palmer is here. The, the well -known, in New Jersey. You know that well-known skeptic. Yeah, I've been to New Jersey once, twice, to go to the airport to go to New York. That's right. Oh, I got a ticket there. I was speeding. That's the only time I, that's what I remember when I think of New Jersey, getting a ticket. <laughs> All right, I guess I got to go back. Anyway, so I'm speaking to Richard Saunders. As I said, he's a very gr good friend of mine. I don't want to say an old friend because you are not old. You're younger not than yet. I am. But we have, we have known each other for many years and we first met yeah. in some really interesting places. And I want to show a, a picture of where we first met. Let me find this photo. Uh -huh. We had, um, when I it first was that started, bar, wasn't it? No, where? Sorry. You'll find out in a second. We, um, oh gosh, there's so many pictures of you. Oh my goodness. You're all over my, my picture feed. So do you, have, do, you have, do you have the picture of that day we were comparing Kansas scars? Do you remember we were in Las Vegas and we somewhere. were both doing our thing here to, to I show each other our Kansas scars? Yeah. <laughs> so this, so a long time ago, I have not always been involved in skepticism. This is a new thing for me, new, where maybe about 2002 is when I started getting involved. Richard was already an old hat at it. And, and so I went on, um, I went to a few different conferences and people were, they had these things called the Amazing Adventures, which were the mm. James Randi Educational Foundation's uh, cruises. So the I'd never been on a cruise before, but I went. Yeah, there's got a picture. I've got mine over no, here. Well, you can't see. It's him. Randy. Yeah, mine's over it's here. He's over here. You can't see him. I have a Randy Voodoo doll also. So let me share the screen and show you show you this one here. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is one of the yeah. pictures. Back in the day, <laughs> can you guys see that? <laughs> there's Richard Saunders right there. Oh, and here I am. That's the bad astronomer. And that's Phil Plate and his wife Marcella, and we are yes. in a hot tub on a cruise ship yes. in Alaska. <laughs> in Alaska, you know what I loved about the, part of that voyage was that the seas got a little bit choppy, and mm -hmm. I discovered I could handle that quite well. It didn't worry me too much. Some of our party got quite seasick, but we went to the largest swimming pool and we jumped in the pool, and the pool was sloshing around like this. Oh. But we were getting free rides from one end of the pool to the other as the boat turned and that was I don't fun. remember I don't remember doing that. That was my absolute first my first first and um cruise and we had so much fun. Here's it was a here's very a, enjoyable trip. Yeah. You know, I didn't know hardly anybody, but check these out. Look at look at this picture I'm gonna show you right now. I dread to think what's coming up. You never know what I'm gonna show. Here <laughs> you are with uh, one of our favorite skeptical uh skeptics. This is uh, oh, Harriet. Harriet Hall yes. and on the cruise, and I'm afraid of what I might. Do find you like next. My, do you like the, the dark <laughs> wig I was wearing? There, there we Rebecca, are. The yeah, that's right. And, and the, then here, the here's the you made little origami, oh. little origamis for people, and I yes. think you must have made that for Sterling because that's uh, I think that's Sterling's hand. I could have well done, yeah. Yeah, we had so much fun going cruises. That cruise was fun for me, but not as much as later because I was just kind of still getting into this world of um, skepticism and and so on. Oh, wait, here's another one. Oh my gosh, I don't have very many photos. So <laughs> here is a picture of us, you and I, back when I had black hair. 
people people can judge the years by what color hair I had. And this it's one, I told you it was a bar would end up in this somewhere. Yeah, There's somewhere. you and I. And I see still a cool head above here too. And one of these with the Pegasus, yeah. There you are with Tim Tam. Oh, must sticks. No, must sticks, yeah. Look at you. Look at you. I always bring I always bring must sticks to international meetings because the very first time <laughs> I saw an American try one here in Australia, they spat it out, and I was completely confused because to me, must sticks are candy, and everybody loves them. And to meet somebody who didn't like them was, and then it's then it struck me that Americans don't know the taste. So here's a tip to any Australian travellers going to the U.S. when all this is over. Take mustics, pass them around, and hilarity wins you. Expressions. They're What's hilarious. Their expressions. Absolutely hilarious. I I I love um, red licorice, and I think that's one of those foods that people mm. probably can't stand. Oh, I, love I can't it. eat yes, black licorice. Yes, that's popular. gross. No. Okay. No. No. So anyway, Richard is the host. I don't know, even know if you would call you the host. You are. Yes. This is I am, the podcast I am the, the Skeptic Zone. You are. Yeah, that, you are it. I mean, well, no, that's that's unfair because there are two co-hosts, myself and Stefan. We started right. the show. Stefan takes part a couple of times a year. Uh, he sort of stepped back, which is fine. Uh, I produce the show, you know, the mechanics of it. I run the show, uh, and but I really do rely on on my reporters, my wonderful reporters uh, in North America and Australia, and guest reporters. And you've done guest reports for me quite often, which is Segments, you know, they do medical segments or society segments. We've got a really interesting segment coming up on the next show uh, about how uh, children, boys and girls, especially girls, can be inspired by good role models in fiction and television and things like that. So it's I do a lot on the show. Of course, I do interviews. I love doing interviews. I do voice stuff i read stuff but yeah it's, it's really a, a team effort the, the skeptic zone podcast it is a magazine kind of uh podcast yeah. uh, rob palmer had done an interview with you recently for skeptical inquire magazine and he shared it with me and i was rereading that again um and he was you were talking about how your format is different from a lot of the other podcast formats and that you're just over 10 years you're one of the oldest podcasts. 12 years now 12, 12 years yeah 500 it's, episodes. 600 and something now right next one 611 the idea i i did po i did various shows before it experiments trying to get my get into this one was a video show which was very hard work to do and it i was in the, the format of the show actually came from a TV show that I used to watch as a kid called Simon Townsend's Wonderworld, where the show would start with this guy. It was an afternoon show for children. Uh, and he'd be at a desk and he'd have a dog with him, Woodrow the dog, and he'd introduce the show. Hi, kids, coming up on the day show, we have this, 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 and this. And then they would go to the reporters and maybe you'd get two or three reporters with their little segments. Mm -hmm. And so when I started The Skeptic Zone, that was in my head. We'll introduce the show, say what's coming up, anything else I'd like to say so people know what's coming up, and then we get into the show. So here's the first segment. We've got a 15-minute interview with Crazy Maynard, Australia's biggest goose, interviewing somebody. <laughs> then we have a little ad break. Then we have the next reporter with their book review or their thoughts of this or, or their in-depth analysis or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the ad breaks since day one have always been to promote other skeptics. Mm -hmm. And I've never taken a dime for these. You know, I don't charge for ads. When people hear the skeptic zone and you hear an ad break, I'm doing that to promote other skeptical podcasts and other skeptics around the planet. And, and we, we love that. And you and GSOW. And I do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and somebody said once said to me, well, you know, you, you, you promote things like skeptoid or the, the ESP podcast or other podcasts and you know you should be charging for those because you know it's a business well yes you know I've got to make some money too but in this situation um, I just think it's the right thing to do so I'm happy to promote uh, other podcasts yeah. and other skeptical uh, ideas and things like that so when you're listening to the show folks uh, I'm not taking any money for all the ads you hear they're, they're done because I think it's the right thing to do 
I've been one of your uh, financial supporters in my tiny little way for years. And I, it feels good because you feel like you're part of something. Um, you feel like, you know, my donation, at, you know, adds up over time, especially if other people do. We really do need to support our creators because there is no money in skepticism. Not really. There might the, um, be, but I haven't found it. And, and they've never sent me my big pharma checks. I don't know about you, but. I, oh yeah, I get them all the time. I, I must <laughs> take them. To, I must cash them you in must one start day. Cashing no, the, them. <laughs> There's no, no money. the money means that I, I. Well, no, not really. But the money I do get from Patreons and um, PayPal subscribers means that I can pay for the the show to be housed somewhere and distributed and stuff, and I can pay for equipment to keep the show going, like this thing which I use. Oh boy, it's all hooked up to everything. I, Richard loves microphones. <laughs> You're going, it, so, uh, uh, oh. there we go. Microphone, equipment. Hello, hello. That, yeah. Am I back? Hello? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I shouldn't have touched all the stuff over there. Don't touch anything. Don't touch <laughs> anything. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, but, and it also, I can buy, occasionally I have enough to supply my reporters with microphones and stuff. Uh, I can do things occasionally like, get them to conferences which is really cool and at this time of the coronavirus all my other sources of my normal income which would be in the entertainment industry is all dried up you know like a lot of entertainers and artists will tell you the same thing there are no gigs there are no i do tv and film work you know I, there's not, all that's just no productions at the moment so it's good to have the uh, the support of uh, listeners all around the world yeah, who we continue to support the skeptic zone. We, we really do. Um, seriously, people, if you have not, and, and financially, it's hard for a lot of people these days. Yeah. But, you know, a couple dollars here and there it helps. If you cannot afford to supply, uh, support a, a podcast or, you know, some kind of agency like Richard Saunders, the skeptic zone, you can do a lot of other things. Like you can give them a five star review on iTunes because that brings them up in the ratings of um, uh, in the feed for the iTunes people. So they're more likely to be recommended. Um, also, you can share the episodes. You yeah, can talk yeah, about it and help. Yeah. So there's a lot of things people can do. We really you find that, you know, since the skepticism is such a very small little world, I mean, there's probably more people who golf professionally than there are professional skeptics i guess oh yes by magnitude <laughs> yeah, there's money in golf and professional golfing but we, we but really I, have to support each other yeah now i will say though over the years it's, it's quite possible that i've i've made more money infrequently than other pr people doing skepticism for two reasons the first one is i was on a tv show for a couple of seasons where i was uh, paid to be a skeptical judge on a show that judges paranormal activity it was quite strange it was called the one i have a and clip for, too i'm going to show you a clip oh here we go all right let me, let me, gonna show let me a clip. pull that up real quick let me get it let me get it um, and that was a paid gig you know i i, I went on there Sorry. you're lining it up i want to get yeah i was trying to get it lined up okay let me share it real quick and then all right you can talk about this hold on it's just it's just a 32 seconds long you guys so. okay Bear with me. And then it's crunch time when they face our judges. I'm sorry, you're not the one. The skeptic Richard Saunders. You know, it's not up to me to say psychics don't have powers. It's up to them to show me that they do. It sounds like they've just put words out of science. It's yet to be shown that these energies that we talk about are Yes, but you guys were wrong about acupuncture. No, we weren't. And Memphis Stacey DeMarco. <laughs> what did you think of this phrase website? Challenging science. I, for one, can't wait. Oh, that's just amazing. That was that's fun. So amazing. Um, so <laughs> let me get back to this picture. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was fun. I mean, when I when I when I when I see that, I I cringe a little bit because um, I hadn't yet learned how to uh, control my voice properly. So I always sounded always sounded a little bit like that, which makes me cringe. But anyway, it's a long time ago, and it was a lot of fun. Well, tell us but, about so, it because you couldn't be as skeptical as I mean. So the idea was to pick the best 
Australian psychic, right? So uh, yeah, they tested them. So you couldn't say they're all no nobody passed. <laughs> I mean, they're all a bunch of BS. You couldn't do that because right. you then had there'd be no show. So so the, I mean, the, the premise of the show was from day one. They said here here are the the top seven psychics we've found. Um, and we're going to put them through various tests and whoever scores the best gets to stay. And if someone doesn't score well, they can go home. So my, my job was hard and easy. I mean, it was easy because either they did well in the tests or they didn't, you know, that that's easy to judge. Uh, the hard part was continually having to analyze them on the spot and come up with good sound bites and things to put the skeptical point of view. Ultimately the show was, not going to paint this psychics in a, a very bad light because the audience want psychics to be true. But I was on there to be hopefully the voice of, uh, of reason. And the producers asked my advice about setting up tests. I mean, what they said, how can we make this test to your satisfaction? What we can do. And I said, listen, if we were to run proper tests on these people, no one would pass any test. Do you want that? <laughs> So we have to do TV tests, fun tests, what ifs, you know, and run them once, mm -hmm. which is scientifically invalid anyway. But that wasn't the point of the show. The point of the show was fun and entertainment. Did the, and, and, the audience vote on who they liked the best psychic? Yeah, in the, the end, they was, it? yeah, it was a popularity contest. So the last episode, people phoned in for their favorite. So whatever. And who, who is the top psychic? You did it there were two, two seasons. The first top psychic was a lady called Charmaine Wilson. I haven't heard about her for a while. I think she still does what we call the club circuit in this country. And the second winner was Michael Wheeler, I think his name was. You might have got that wrong. It's a long time ago, uh, but we don't hear much about these people. I mean, there are lots of people in Australia who simply do the club circuit who appear for a night and, and do uh, audience readings and go to the next place and go to the next place. And long, I mean, the Australian skeptics have long said, well, wow. so these people have an ability which would revolutionize our society like nothing else mm -hmm. ever in the history of everything. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing? They're doing nightclubs and entertainment. Does that's, that doesn't make much sense. And they didn't anyway. predict a coronavirus. If they did, I didn't hear it. <laughs> now that's a that's interesting we should mention that given us a little information and you know a heads up that's nice interesting if people uh subscribe to the skeptic magazine that one over there whoop there we are the journal from australian skeptics and in the issue that's just come out uh i can't show you i don't have a physical copy i've written a report about a tv psychic here and he also does the club circuits who claims he predicted the coronavirus. And I've analyzed his prediction and oh, really? showed, showed that, um, no, I'm a bit skeptical that he actually predicted the coronavirus. Which one is this? He is goes Michael by the Holmes? stage. Holmes? No, no. He goes by the stage name of Harry T. Harry T. And he's also uh, was endorsed by Larry King. So... There you go. Well, it must be real. It must be must real. Be you, real. <laughs> you don't just do psychics because you are an all around skeptic and you have a wide breadth of knowledge from so many areas. And I think a lot of it is partly because of your involvement with the Australian skeptics. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my drop bear shirt from yep. Australian skeptics. I love this. Very shirt. good. Um, not only because of your involvement and you were a past president at the Australian Skeptics, but also because of partly because of the twice, speech, twice partly because sure. of the show, because you have these segments that you're running in their mag magazine like segments. It helps to really you learn a wide breadth of things. Like I, you know, I'm involved in this Wikipedia world, and there my team will bring me Wikipedia pages to read to to go over, and I I've never heard of the pseudoscience qualities of uh, cow poop. That was a Wikipedia page we just rewrote. I didn't know anything about it. And I get these weird <laughs> things they bring me and I'm like, you know, so after a while yeah. you develop this, this world of, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot out there. There, there. there is a lot and people can forget that. In our field of skeptic, scientific skepticism, it's a huge field. 
it covers so many different topics. It's, I mean, I struggle, sincerely struggle to, to keep a, a good uh, grasp on everything. Um, and it's simply because of the sheer number of years, you know, 20 plus years I've been seriously involved in this, mm -hmm. that I have a breadth of knowledge. It doesn't come quickly. I think ultimately it boils down to what a friend of mine, uh, Chrissy Wilson, has a doctorate in anomalistic psychology, which is the study of why people believe these things. You know, we've got to the stage now where, mm -hmm. although we have appropriately open minds about any claim that comes along, um, we're not seriously expecting suddenly for someone to talk to the dead or water divining to be real or something like that. But what, what I find fascinating is why do people think that other people can talk to the dead or they can talk to the dead or water divining and water divining is one of the things mentioned Randy again, that really got me into this because in 1980, oh. James Randy came to Australia uh, at the request or the invitation of Dick Smith the famous Australian aviator and adventurer and entrepreneur. And he conducted a very famous series of water divining tests. And if anybody hasn't seen this, it's on YouTube. Just look for James Randi in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's one of the uh, foundation in the modern era. It's one of the foundation uh, documentaries about skepticism. James Randi in Australia. He tested all these water diviners and I was watching as a 14 year old kid or whatever I was at the time when it was aired. And it was one of those moments because at the end of the documentary, when they all fail and it's clear that they fail and Randy explains why they failed. And it's just makes so much sense. And he says to the room of the water diviners of the diviners here today, who still believes in water divining? I'm, I'm sitting there watching TV and suddenly all their hands shot up. Mm -hmm. And I just had my, I did a double take. I said, this can't be real. How can, how can they, how can they all still believe in something which they've just completely failed at doing with all of them? Very ex explanation with very good explanations. Of course, since then I've discovered that is the norm. Yeah. People will, uh, failure only reinforces their belief in whatever their, their, their belief is. Yeah. Well, but then, please watch that. Sometimes. Watch that. I put it in the show notes. I'm making myself a mm. note. Now you've you've been involved in with James Randi many times. James Randi. Many times. Give everybody an idea who James Randi is for the two people out there who don't know who he is. <laughs> I mean, keep mentioning this man's name, but they're like James what? Randi what? was born in 1928 in Canada. He was a child prodigy. He became a very accomplished magician and escape artist, and he was always of a skeptical outlook. He, um, he learned from very famous magicians of the era. And then when in the s early seventies, when people like Yuri Geller came along doing, um, well, you know, spoon bending, the old spoon trick, mm -hmm. uh, Randy was one of the few people who actually really made a fuss about it and said, well, you know, this is a magician's trick. What Yuri Geller is doing and his others, it's a great, I'm glad people were entertained. It's fantastic. Good. Great. Magic's wonderful. But he's trying to pass himself off as having divine powers or supernatural powers. And Randy just thought that was wrong you know, please pass yourself off as a magician, an entertainer, give everybody a thrill and they'll be scratching their heads for, for years. Uh, so that's where James Randi really came to the fore and he's been doing it ever since. Now he's retired now uh, and living quietly in Florida. I haven't seen him for a few years, which is, which is uh, too bad. But awesome. Randy, and I, Randy and I had many adventures because I became part of the TAM and part of the Million Dollar Challenge, which was enormous fun. And I did a tour with James Randi in the end of 2015, I think it is, here in Australia. We did six or seven capital cities in a week where he was doing a stage show. And I was either interviewing him, like the fireside chat situation, or I was presenting the show. And then we'd show the documentary, uh, The Honest Liar. And um, 
yeah, so Randy and I got on famously all the time. We always had lots of laughs, and it was always a pleasure to to work with Randy and a thrill, you know, to work with the man. Um, and you know, and the the odd occasion he'd come to me to seek my advice. I'm thinking, what is this James Randy seeking my advice? This is <laughs> um, one of the happiest memories I have with Randy and I. Backstage in Melbourne in 2012, we were at Australian Skeptics Convention, and we were just chatting, and we spent an hour swapping spoon bending stories. And it's it's only when you do spoon bending for a long time you can actually get to the stage where you have stories to swap with other, other spoon benders. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. He's uh, James Randi's an amazing talent, and he's called the amazing. James Randi, the amazing Randi, yeah. artist. He kind of is, is what uh, Houdini was, you know, where he was a magician yeah, for yeah. a very long time and then kind of got yeah. into the spiritualism and the debunking of it. Probably, well, Houdini was trying to find, supposedly he was trying to find somebody to speak to his mother who he yeah. adored. But Randy was just, I think it was just an honorable, he didn't like that people were lying to, to people. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Randy well, has the attitude I have. That there are two types of people out there. There are the ones who are innocently deceived, and they've deceived themselves, which in my experience are the majority. And there are the sharks, the people out there just uh, conning people out of their, their money. And that's a great book if you haven't read Flim Flam. Flam. Yeah, it's very Flim Flam, I can, That's a great skeptical primer. That's good. Uh, I sincerely recommend you. I mean, there are, there's three or four books that you should have on your skeptic shelf. Flim Flam is one. The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan is another one. Uh, the new book by the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is a wonderful uh, primer for skepticism. It covers a lot of things. Yet. I have it on my shelf, but it's with all the other books that I haven't read. Yeah. Everybody's well, I, it. I read it. That, well, I was very lucky enough to get a, an advanced copy. So I could give um, uh, Steve Novella and, and the Rogues uh, an opinion on the book. And then just this year, uh, a very dear friend of mine uh, gave me the audio copy, which is Steve Novella reading the book. And I absorb information so much better by listening than reading. That's just the way my brain works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And in the lockdown, I go for long walks. So in go the headphones and on goes the audio book. So it's, yeah, and I, again, I learned a lot. It's like the TV show Cosmos by Carl Sagan, which is, uh, oh, I have on DVD, but that's the, that's another thing. And this one, this copy somewhere, it's autographed to me, which was really Diane. nice. Diane, who, who um, I don't know if you can read that, but something yeah. like the, that. Yeah. Origami master, leader of the skeptical community and gifted interviewer with admiration. 2014, Anne. Whew. That was quite ah. something. So the, t the TV show Cosmos is something I'll re-watch every couple of years, the whole series. Uh, I think I will re-listen to that The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe book every couple of years. It just reinforces and, and you know, it, 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 it helps you keep these things in mind. Oh, speaking of when we met and James oh. Randi. <laughs> he was that, there on that cruise. When I, he was on the cruise. Uh -huh. And I was making origami for lots of people. And Randy took me aside and said, you know, Richard, this is my James Randi impression. Okay, let's hear it. Wait, wait a minute. So, James Randi quite liked the origami I was doing. And just at the end of the cruise, he said, Richard, I think you should make an origami flying pig. <laughs> so that inspired me. <laughs> you did that so well. That was, boy, that was perfect. You got his <laughs> that is, perfect. That inspired me. When I came back here to Australia, I sat down and over the course of two or three days, I invented, ah. Uh, yep, there's a flying origami pig. pig. Mine's, origami mine's flying autographed. Pig. Oh, cool. You autographed it. What do you mean, oh, cool? You're the one that gave it to me <laughs> it, it with resin on it so that it's. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that right was. Right here with me. That he was, with me all the time. <laughs> or she. That was true. Uh, 
that was terrific because uh, for any origami artist like myself to to have some to make something which lots of people then make because I put the instructions on YouTube. If you look up flying pig origami, you'll see it. Me showing people how to make the flying pig. So it's very touching. You know, I made something which that which looks like what it should look like. It looks like a flying pig. It's not difficult to make, and lots of people subsequently made it. So that was great. You you sat down with me. Richard came has you've been to my house twice? You've you've been here for a couple? Twice. twice. Right? Yeah, so he's come down to uh he has family in the San Francisco area ish. That's about ish. two hours from me. So a couple yeah. times Richard will come down to he'll take the bus to San Jose, I'll drive up yes. to pick him up, and then we hang out. I bring him back down to Salinas. He did a, a he was kind enough to do a talk for Monterey County Skeptics in January this year. <gasps> was it really this year's this year's been a very long year wow that feels like five years ago it was <laughs> really this does. year this january and you came and you did a talk and was it this time we went to, no the time before i took you to the winchester mystery house just you That's and i right. that was fun <laughs> in san jose if you ever guys if we ever get a chance to go into the san jose area and you see the big signs for the Winchester Mystery House. It's a lot yeah. of fun. It's really kind of Well, fun. you know, whenever I'm whenever I'm with you, because I've been doing this show for 12 years, a lot of my life is ac actually documented week by week in the show. It's strange. Yeah. So if you go back on the in the archives of the Skeptic Zone podcast, you'll see the episode where you and I went, or you can hear the episode uh -huh. where you and I went to the Winchester Mystery House. And other things we've done together over the years, yeah. Yeah, you're no, fun. fun, so I've we been, have a lot of fun together. I've been there twice to to your place in Salinas. So and there'll right. be more once we get COVID. <laughs> but what you so now you you reminded me. I sat down. We we you are right now. We sat down at your desk and we did origami lessons for a few hours. That's he right. made me learn origami and I did it. I was able to. <laughs> I, I should have brought my little frogs. I sat at. Uh, you made frogs. Yes. <laughs> I made these little frogs where you you push on the back and they hop. It's so much fun. I I you know I like to keep my hands busy. It's really hard for me not to sit here and want to. Well, I have been playing with little items I have right here. You guys can't see, but I, I like to I have a little kitty cat that I've been playing with right here. While nah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just a, I'm just a little kid myself. You've also been coming out and playing trivia the last yes. two weeks. I've been running a trivia. I mean, this, this coronavirus thing is really awful. I mean, it's awful, but we have made the best of it in a lot of ways. The Zoom is amazing, the Zoom thing. And so yeah, I yeah. started this trivia night. A friend of mine had put one on and I sat in and I said, I want to do it. So Thursday nights in Pacific time, California, we started doing a uh, zoom trivia. And if you guys want to come and join, come on over. I don't know what we're going to do if we grow to be, you know, a hundred people or more, but we're at like 28 people and Richard's played the last two times and it's so much fun. It, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, we get that sense of community back. We got, um, uh, I, I can see old friends and then we go to breakout rooms and our little team discusses the answers and, and it's all on and on. on sneak into your rooms really and nice. I can listen to what you guys are saying. It's, yeah. I write Susan a question. Trigger. So I'm listening to you okay. guys reason them out and I'm, I'm like this, not letting you see my face whenever you're trying to reason it out. Like, hmm, what year would that have been? Let's see. Let's see. That was 1945 when that was over. So then this must have been so interesting. And I now I have to, when I first started writing the questions, I thought I was going to have a Monterey County, California group. And immediately, next thing I know, they're Australians. There's two Australians. Richard has been in there and um, Steve, Roberts. Steve Roberts has been in there and other Australians are joining because it's a good time for you in Australia, right? Seven o'clock. My time is about 11 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. And for, and for those of us who are in the lockdown, you know who can make it. it it's it's okay yeah nice little break people put it on and and anyway yeah. so it's it's been a lot of fun to connect with people like i like to tell people that i see richard in person more than i see my siblings <laughs> and they live 45 <laughs> minutes from me and that's not a lie i see him far more and, and actually i'm happy with that <laughs> he's much more entertaining him and i are much more on the same path we, life, yeah we have a lot of fun <coughs> We, we normally have a lot of fun together, yeah. We, we did New Zealand together? Yes, we oh both spoke at the New Zealand uh, Skeptics Conference in Queenstown about four years ago, three years ago. Has it, and has it been that so I turned Something like that. I mean, it's not a far trip for, to, for me to go to New Zealand. 
So I turn up and there you were, and we just had a, a wonderful time. We both gave uh, talks, um, but on the second day of the conference, uh, uh, I got hit by the flu like a, like a ton of hammers from Thor himself. I was so sick, but I just took lots of drugs and just kept going. He, you know, but I, with, he went along with hmm. it, and I'm gonna share a screen a picture, you know, because I do. This is this is us because it was held in Queenstown, which is uh, yeah. at, at uh, by the airport, and they had this beautiful facility. And here we are outside of that building. We went for a walk, and it's got all the signs of how far everything is away from yeah. everything. Beautiful place, my God! The, the, oh, the view when you were the views are talking, just stuck. You didn't want to. You didn't want to move. Yeah. You didn't want to. You're looking out past the people's. Um, you're talking to. And yeah. it's just this view, I don't know if I have a picture of that handy, but you, you just didn't want to look at the audience. You wanted to look past them at the, at the, um, what was going on back there. It's just incredible place. Uh, the New Zealand skeptics, Australian skeptics, UK skeptics, the, the community is so, everywhere I go, every time I speak somewhere, it, it's just such a kinship. These are people mm. you didn't choose as to be your family. Like, you know, you've got your family members that your family, but this feels like a, like a family, but people of choosing. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, not not to not to, to take away anything from what you say, and I agree. But you will find in other walks of life and other fields of interest, people will probably report the same thing. You know, in the right. mountain climbers club, or the the bike riders club, or the um, the homeopath society would say the same thing. <laughs> I meet the best people in my X Y. But that's you're just right, you're right. And and you know, <laughs> I have I have another. Sorry, I I hit this. I shouldn't. Have, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I have another screen share for you. That okay. um, this is from. Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know, but the, they used to have these conferences called the Amazing Meeting, the James Randi Educational Foundation, and so we refer to them as TAM. T -A -M. TAM. And so there's a lot of good you know we feel a lot of amazing things about the tams we used to attend now we're attending some of the other conferences which are psycon which is like you know it's also also awesome but the amazing meetings the thing about them were is that they were huge you know you get a thousand people 700 people and psychons yeah. that now but uh we used to go to this place called the del mar yeah and yeah. we would hang out and here is Oh my god, that was turn it off. Stop. Oh, it was great. That was too great. embarrassing. Oh come on. You could play the guitar. Well, sometimes, but no, that, that was, wasn't good that was because I, I I forgot the chords and it was embarrassing. Oh no, it wasn't. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was great. I watched it twice. Actually, my, my dream is one day, uh, with enough practice, to do a duet with, with George Rabb. That would be yeah. fantastic. Maybe one day. Carl with a K shot the video, by the way. I should mention that. And I see him on my feed now saying, hey, I shot that video. Yes, you sure did, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do anything nowadays without somebody out there filming whatever. Right. No, it, you're probably right. It is some good, good but, stuff out there. Well, while I can, there's a few other things I could recommend. If people are interested in this sort of thing, it, it, and as you were saying before, you and I have a very broad breadth of, of interest in skepticism, which co uh, covers many topics from alternative medicine to spoon bending to magic tricks and things like that. But one of the, the books I can recommend anybody in, who, who's interested in skepticism and what we do, this is a book called the Full Facts Book of Cold Reading. Oh, Ian Rowland. Ian Rowland. This is a very and famous book. I've learnt so much from that book, from rereading it and rereading it and rereading it, and then going to see many, many of these people who say they can talk with the dead. And after reading the book and studying it and getting the experience of going back and back and then sitting down and analysing transcript after transcript, mm -hmm. I have a hopefully a very good understanding of how this works you know when people say they couldn't have known that about me what is interesting though 
is I'm rubbish at doing it. I'm not very good at giving cold readings, passing myself off as a psychic saying this, it, somehow that, that, that's not one of my skills, but analyzing it and understanding it when I hear it, I can do that. And this will shock many people, but of all the- I'm ready to be shocked. Seen, let me, let me, you're let me, ready to be shocked? Yeah, I'm ready. Of all the times I've seen uh, live psychic acts and people who can talk to the dead, no matter where it is, Nobody has yet impressed me. I know you're shocked. I know you're shocked. shocked. But you can, I can also have a pretty good understanding when somebody is innocently deceived and just using bleeding obvious and rather routine cold reading and when someone's hot reading. And, and it doesn't oh, yeah. come automatically, you know, well, and, and you have to really... Accurate. As a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, mm -hmm. um, you can paint it in that way. Yeah. It, the rule of thumb is, and this can be deceiving, however, if they're too accurate too often, they know. But you, you know, th that's not how, how cold reading works. Cold reading is a different skill, a different set, you could say skill set. Hot reading is knowing too, too much and getting it right too often and not wasting any time. And, and there are tricks to, in that too. But yeah, it's, the whole area is just fascinating. It's, it's so interesting. I want you to talk about um, this other project you did. Um, Amanda just asked me how hot it is because I have my fan. It's just because it's kind of dead in the room. Salinas right now is 70 degrees, which is 21 degrees Celsius for you guys. So it's not hot. It's just, I don't know. I'm, it's all right. Yeah, it's just fine for me. It's about normal weather. But can you talk really briefly about the project you've been working on that you thought would take you a few months? It's taking you a few <laughs> years on predictions project. I think this is really Oh, my goodness. All right. So one moment. Um, there's so much to talk to Richard about. It's, it's somewhere over here. It, it's too much. So I'm trying to go through the different topics really quickly. I'll have to look for them later. Somewhere in my collection, in, in, my, in my library, I've got every issue of a magazine that's no longer physically in production. I think you can still get it on, online called the International Psychics Directory. And they, I can't remember when they started, 10, 12, 13 years ago. Every year they'd, they'd publish a page of tomorrow or what's coming up tomorrow, looking into the future, where Australia's top psychics would give their predictions. And I, I collected these magazines, but they only came out once a year. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll analyze these predictions but, and see if they're accurate. So I did a couple. And about <laughs> four years ago, I decided, I know, I'll do, I'll do a lot, I'll do more. I'll try to collect every psychic prediction made in Australian media internet, radio, television, newspapers uh, for 10 years. And that will give me a good lot of predictions. Then, then I can honestly say, this is what we discovered. That's turned into 20 years worth. So from 2000 to 2020, every psychic prediction I can possibly find in any media made in Australia by Australian psychics it's somewhere north of 1,500 at the moment. I thought you were just doing print magazines or journals. Everything. Every, I didn't know you were doing it, audio too. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. So it was going to be a report I was going to have at the end of 2017, mm -hmm. then 2018, then 2019. And now I'm really during lockdown making the big effort to make it ready by 20. 20 or probably early 2021 so i can say we've reached the end of 2020 and here are the predictions I think that'd be and good. so it meant scouring libraries here in sydney and melbourne for every back issue of certain magazines going back 20 years and looking at every issue yeah, so going I, through because they would say that's the one that had all the predictions in it so when you, scan, well, you cherry picked it yeah, yeah. It, that it's good that's going to happen here's my oh, yeah. prediction when when this comes out psychics will complain that i didn't use their predictions that came true or whatever well the, the the thing is i'm doing the best i can to get every possible prediction i can of course i'm not going to get every prediction going back 20 years that's not possible there's magazines and radio interviews and tv things that i simply don't have access to which don't exist anymore or whatever um 
and some of them are just rambling rambling predictions which so how do i mark this is it right did it come true is it too vague is it correct but 50 50 i predict prince william will have a baby boy well he did okay but okay true prediction but it's a 50 50 shot or most most predictions so far i've catalogued are under the heading of celebrity what's lindsay lohan going to be doing next year we'll find out the most Common name is Nicole Kidman. She's come up more often than any other oh, celebrity. She's Australian. She's Australian and she's been popular for you know many years, so she's the number one. Uh, lots, lots of times famous people will be predicted to die, especially the royal family. Most especially years really old. So the for most mother, years the queen something, is gonna yeah. die any day now. You, usually the predictions are something along the lines of the i see a morning at buckingham palace and, and the passing of a senior royal well this has been going for years and years oh, and years, and years. Gonna one day it's going to happen sometimes you know it's but i mean I, like i say I, i've i'm heading north of 1500 predictions so far so finding them is one thing then for example with, with the the magazine's new idea in women's day going back 20 years going through every issue every issue and then finding a prediction i'd have to, i'd just photograph it i've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs of pages then i have to transcribe them into the data into the spreadsheet or i'll use a, a text recognition put them in then it's scoring them having to carefully read every prediction and then doing the research to see whether it happened. And sometimes that's a huge undertaking because they'll make lots of predictions about a certain area or something that happened to somebody or the stock market. And you have to go scour through archives and news reports to find out whether it was true, or whether it was false. So it's a much bigger undertaking than I ever anticipated, but I want it to be something substantial. By the end, I can say, this isn't just 20 predictions. This isn't just covering a couple of years. This is 20 years of hundreds upon hundreds of predictions analyzed and scored. And so far, more or less, and this is, has to have a margin of error because so much is, can be seen to be open to interpretation. The rule of thumb is about 10% of what is predicted can be seen to have come true in some way or another sometimes it's absolutely true which is what that's the cat at the door i warned you about earlier i can't hear it i can't hear her. yeah uh sometimes they'll come absolutely true which is what you would expect if you make hundreds of predictions some have to come true you can't make hundreds of predictions and, and have everyone fail even if you're just pulling them out of a hat uh so more or less 10 percent. but there's a lot of a lot of predictions are simply too vague like what do you see in the year for uh, coming up for Nicole Kidman? Well, Nicole Kidman's heart is always true and she feels insecure sometimes, but she hopes for this. That's not a prediction. It's just waffle. So there's a lot of that waffly stuff to get through, but yeah. And I've had the help of a lot of people uh, over the years. We've have afternoons or even online. We're all get together. And I say, right, here's the prediction. Let's go for it. This happened in 2004. We're, where this person said that I predict blah, 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 let's research it and we'll come to a consensus and move on. But I've still got, I don't know, hun a couple, hundreds to get through. It's all right, all right. And now I heard I have it. to do this. Yeah, here we go. I'm tempting fate. Which one? Aha! This is the one I keep putting into cat jail. All right. This is the cat prison I have in my room. She's just jumped out. There it is. Hi there. Is that's that Henrietta. Oh, Henrietta. Hi, Henrietta. Yeah. And that's her cat, her cat, her cat, cat prison. <laughs> and it's funny too, as, so soon as, you said, as soon as you said you had to get the cat, I have a bird feeder right next to me, you know, as a window and it's closed. But as soon as you said that, the birds jumped off the bird feeder and the bird feeder was slammed into my window right here because they were trying to escape because they heard the cat coming. <laughs> birds are smart. 
And now she's at my feet. Oh, good grief. I don't know how we get along without our cats and dogs, to be honest with you. All right, come on. So when you're done with this, hello, Henrietta. Hello, beautiful thing. Who's the booty kitty? Mew, 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 mew. I have to to kick her out because... Wait a sec. Okay. Out. Goodbye. (laughs) I love him. The, uh, you, when you're finished with this, yeah, you got big plans for it. Somebody said in the, uh, Rob Palmer says it should be a book. And so, and Amanda says a book. it should be a TV series. There's well, a lot you know, what you're doing. I'm, I've already started in my head. I've started to write the paper, which will accompany it, which will have explanations and reasons and, uh, the, the way it works with getting the, the, the hits and what I expect to happen because there's hundreds of psychics mentioned or people who think they're psychic they're going to go through which is natural enough they'll go through all their own and then correct them for me to show me that I was really wrong when I said now that prediction's wrong oh no it, no this is what I meant you know no, so what I you expect, meant is not yeah no. what I expect I expect a lot of that It'll probably be interesting for the media for a short while. Um, one, of the, one, of the th- one of the things I was thinking about this whole project originally was then I could go to the media, to the radio stations and the TV shows and whatever, and say, look, you have these people on every year. Here's, here's our, our resident psychic with their predictions for the coming year. And I, say, and, I'll, and I would say, look, you never come have them back next year and sit through and say, well, this is what you predicted. How come you got so many wrong? No, they'll they'll bring them back occasionally when something they said comes right. Yeah, how come they can bring them back? Fuss about it. Mm-hmm. And well, of course, they're the resident TV psychic. They want people to think they've had amazing psychic success because then people will keep watching their show. I know that. I know that. But still, um, and I don't think a similar project has ever been undertaken. Not with the, the breadth and the scope of this one and the sheer volume of predictions. So it'll be so? interesting. I don't think so. I, I haven't heard of one. 20 years and, and hundreds upon hundreds of predictions analyzed and cataloged and everything like that. I think it's the a book. Spread, the spreadsheets are, are huge. The spreadsheets. I think it's a book. I really do. I think it would be like amazing to see a book, to hear your thoughts, breaking it down like you just did, where you're saying, about Nicole Kidman and the excuses mm. people make. And I think that would be, I'd like Quite to possibly. I think that's something that I will think about later when it's done. When yeah, it's done. Let's, let's get it done first. Let's, when it's done, because I, I imagine there'll be people coming to me with things I've never thought about of how to, how to analyze the data. We'll, well see. You, put a, you should do a paper. I'll do a paper. And when the paper, and then you can get all the feedback you want from the paper and then use it to write the the book. Yeah, yeah. uh, You know, it's not like you don't have enough to do. And I want to show another clip. This is really, (laughs) really quick. This is a long clip, but I'm only going to show a couple, uh, you know, a very short bit of it so that you you can. um, I hear it somewhere. Do you guys hear that? I know that music. Really wonderful, beautiful, beautifully done video documentary you did. That's Heidi Robinson. That's Lauren Cochran. Ah, uh, there's Ada. Gosh, she was so young. Ah. How fun. Now, this isn't a video just about the kids in the playground. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Richard Saunders. Welcome to the Vaccination Chronicles. In this video, I'd like to tell you about a time in our history, not so long ago, when parents lived with the very real fear that at any time their children could succumb to the deadly effects of infectious diseases. I'd like to tell you what it was like back then, but I really can't. I wasn't there. I was born after the widespread introduction of vaccination for diseases such as pertussis, which is whooping cough, diphtheria, rubella, tuberculosis, 
and infantile paralysis, poliomyelitis. Okay, as I was just gonna show just that little taste of right. uh, the video. This is, well, I've, I've watched this so many times. This is so well done. Um, Thank you. And it, it goes back to the idea that vaccinations have been so successful that we have generations of people who have no idea how bad it was and how terrifying. Yeah. I mean, we didn't yeah. even know what brought on polio for a very long time. And, and just the idea of not knowing I mean, you could say, okay, well, if you did this and did that, same with AIDS. I mean, I remember AIDS and how terrifying that was. We didn't know if you were going to get AIDS from touching somebody, kissing someone, toilet yes, seat, I remember. Yeah. blood transfusions. We didn't know what it was. And it was so awful. So, I mean, you put this out and what he does is he interviews people who were of an age that remember that time. They talk about when, you know, their classmates who had polio, who who you know they're in school and they never showed back up in class again yeah, they died yeah. or, or whatever it's just heartbreaking it's 26 yeah. minutes 27 minutes definitely you guys got to watch i'll put it in the show notes yeah the vaccination chronicles and that was made with the help of uh probably listeners to my show i put out a call and some very generous people around the world helped me produce that by basically covering the costs of the editing software i needed at the time and things like that and it was it was so kind of them uh it took a little longer than i anticipated i thought it would be six months it took about a year but but anyway dr carl kruzelniski is in there he's a good friend of mine and a good science communicator and lots of other people and that you can see the easiest way to see that is if you go to skepticzone.tv which is there we go yeah. skepticzone.tv if you scroll right to the bottom of the page you'll see a link to the vaccination chronicles there. I found it. And some, or, and some free origami <laughs> posters people can download. Oh yeah, origami posters. Yeah. We had, um, I think it's a, a really well, not only well put together, but the concept is really important. And we got to interview these people now before they go and their memories are gone. How, what year did you do this? Oh, you've got me. Because you know how it is, years, five years, years. Something, five years, you lose track of the years sometimes. Good, it's a good point because the very first lady I interview died about two years back, I think a year back. So, yeah. You know, Richard, I've always wanted to do one of these in my area. And what I have in my town, in, my, in the local hospital nearby, is we have, a, we have a iron lung. We have a little medical Ooh. museum at our hospital. And I've always wanted to do one where we had people who would, who would explain the iron lung, like, you know, they could show it, explain it. And if we could even get somebody to get in it, like to see what it'd be like to get into that and maybe have a doctor yeah. explain how they would treat somebody. But we're one of the few hospitals, we're one of the few museums in, in the United States that still has iron lungs. They're really hard to find. So there's only like maybe, I don't know. I've seen animal. them. I've, I've seen them in some um, museums here in, in Melbourne. A tiny little Melbourne museum, museum hospital. One, yeah. and, there's, and it's in there. And I go there and I've taken a few people there and I've taken pictures of it. I just, to see that yes, Melbourne, physically yeah. and touch it and say, what? Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing. I mean, it, it, to think that there's something like this, you have to go to a museum. To see what it was. Anyway, that was the, the, the thinking behind the documentary because it sort of reminds me there's really great videos on YouTube of teens and 20 somethings. It's called Reactions, and they're reacting to the first time they're watching Twist and Shout by the Beatles or something like that. There's generations of people who don't know about the past decades, life and, and things like that, you know. And young parents who just didn't don't have no clue that once upon a time children were ended up in iron lungs and calipers and things like that and i think that is like they say is, is vaccinations vaccinations have been so successful that it's partly part of the reason why we have a vaccine anti-vax movement because yeah. nobody remembers that or that was in the old days you know so i just yeah. put a, a note up in here we're getting ready to round up i don't want to take richard's whole day so if people have questions that they would hurry up and and ask them and I can ask Richard, that'd be great. Put them in the comments to the, the feed we have right now. But um, what do you see coming up next? I mean, once we're out of this COVID, I know that they had to cancel the Australian Skeptic Conference, right? No, Did no, it's going in, ahead. Um, it's going ahead online. Oh, it's online. It's online, Gold yeah. Coast. 
and yeah, it's going to be based Brisbane. in the Gold Coast, but but it means the whole world can join us, which is a fantastic thing. So that's I, oh, I, I haven't October. got the dates. Thank you, twenty third, I think. Um, if people go to skeptics.com.au, they can find out more about that. But no, they it's not cancelled. It it's just oh, twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth of October. Yeah. So there'll be international guests. There'll be fun. There's going to be some probably some trivia. That should be a lot of fun. Uh, so the whole world can join us. So that that's really cool. Brian Hart wants to know your favorite color. <laughs> he said, I asked questions. So he, I said, anybody have a question? He says, yeah, what's your favorite color? And, and you got to be careful because <laughs> you have to say it right the first time because if you change your mind. That, that one. Which one, Paisley? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> There's... <laughs> <laughs> right hard you gotta love this, this is a guy. this is a nice color all right i like that blue color see that blue on that dye there that's royal blue or crystal blue yeah it's sort of yeah it's nice that's nice python reference yeah monty python reference what is your favorite color oh what, yes i know your he's he spelled it er y-e-r what's your favorite color what's but you used favorite? you in the in the favorite so we know that you're 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 american because I don't think right. Australian <laughs> you, right. in color you use the wrong spelling for color, Brian, ha, 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 in the British. Ha, ha. So it's yeah, not yeah, really. Yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> what's what's next for uh, Richard Saunders? What do you see quarantine wise? The next well, uh, six months to a year. <laughs> well, I'll probably need that all that time to finish this prediction project. Quite honestly, in the last three or four weeks, I've been really putting on putting in long hours on the project with the help of some friends mm -hmm. uh, to help mark that, but mostly just me bashing away. Uh, I've still got files and files to actually put into the database. The database is fascinating. Yeah, I've it's, seen it. it you've it's seen it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's growing every day too. It's just, just amazing. So that, I mean, because the world's so unpredictable at the moment, talking about predictions, we're not sure. I, I, look forward to visiting you again as soon as i possibly can i miss tam a lot i miss the amazing meetings because it was my it was a big highlight for me every year uh working with randy and doing the talks and stuff there although it was always very busy i was always very very busy at the amazing meetings people overly sort of saw busy. me in, you yeah, take on busy. way too much mm. it was and i always like, Richard, just relax don't you're like but i gotta do this and you're like no, and I'm, I I'd, be run, I'd be running it this way. You're I'd always lose about two kilos at, at there simply because I, I wasn't eating. You know, what, it, food was not a priority at town because I was so busy. But I miss those. Although you've been to Psycon. Psycon, I was not so busy at Psycon, but I do like I do love Psycon. I like Dragon Con, although I can't go this year very sadly. Are they going to uh, still busy. have Dragon Con? I believe no way. so. No, I believe so. You can't have Dragon Con in Atlanta in in September. Uh, one Hell would think, no. but but I, I I'm unless not everybody after... comes masked. They do anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I, I no, I missed that. But one thing I, I will say about Vegas is, is that as much as I love visiting it for four or five days every year, uh, and as much as I got to like Vegas. I don't miss the smoke in yeah, the hotels. Know what you mean. It got pretty bad and I felt pretty awful. Um, and so I just hope that uh, one day the people running the hotels in Vegas will realize that it would, to, it would be to their benefit to stop smoking. I mean, people like me would come back in a heartbeat to do conferences in Vegas if, if it was a smoke-free environment, but we'll see. Uh, David, Nobel? Nobel? I I just cannot pronounce anything that's printed. It drives me nuts. He says, you tricked me into tasting Vegemite at TAM. I still have nightmares. <laughs> I have Vegemite in my, in my house because you I, do. You know, I, people brought it to me when I've gone to, I've been to Australia twice. And so they always give you a gift of something and they give me Vegemite. Yeah. So when Richard came to my house, he spent the night here and everything. And, and he got up in the morning and he said, you wouldn't happen to have any Vegemite, would you? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> you can take it back with you if you want. I'm not eating it. Too. No. And uh, Carl says time. Dragon Con. He says, news I heard about Dragon Con, they can't get their money back on the venue. They'll go bankrupt if they don't have the con. That's crazy. Well, 
you know, I, it's, it's, I've been four times, three times in a row, and then a gap of 10 years, and I went last year. And I was very busy, always just very busy. And in fact, I did two recordings with the SGU people, which was a thrill. Uh, but that's super duper crowded. That's you. It's, you make it's be, like person best friends here, with person everybody. Here, it's yeah. Like, yeah. I don't see how they can really put it, put it off. You know, there's got to be something else, some other way of getting it. You know, if Alana's numbers go up high enough, which there already are, they'll, they'll just have to cancel it just as a health risk. They'll have to say, well, we have to cancel this. That's the state yeah. will do it. And then they'll be forced to give them their money back because that you just can't. Yeah, yeah. That's like yeah. having Trump right now, supposedly, is going to be at a church today where there's 3,000 people in attendance and they have this ionization machine, Richard. I was telling you about this last night. That's going to, it has a filter on it and it takes all the COVID out of the building. And they had a doctor on the news last night. He's like, well, number one, we don't know that that works. And number two, um, if you're talking to somebody next to you and one of you has COVID, it, the filter isn't going to have any, you know, it's not going to have to have time to go through the filter. You're still going to get sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, on top of that, it was created by some people who attended the church. I, I haven't heard any names of anybody. It was like church members created this this ionization. So we should be hearing more about it. And it was really good because I heard two I'm seconds sure last will. night on the news. Uh, they were talking about, you know, the, the protests and all sorts of things. But they brought in and did a little segment on this enough to say, this doesn't sound right. This sounds like um, pseudoscience. Rachel Maddow, uh, for the MSNBC, said, watch this space. I think she's going to be talking about it tonight. So it felt good to think that maybe, maybe the the mainstream news will be talking about this kind of, you know, these COVID cures and COVID this and, 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 and just preying on people's fears, preying on people's um, uh, not uh, um, scientific illiteracy. And Amanda said, she says, is it what, what, prayers? <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? Oh, I must show you something. I don't remember if you saw, if I had, if I was doing this when I saw you last time, well, you know, for years I've been traveling the world making origami for people. I made the pig and I do peacocks and everything. And then at some stage late last year or early this year, it occurred to me that as an Australian going around the world, what, what should I do? I should make a typically Australian thing out of origami. Now, I don't claim to have invented this one, but when I discovered it online and I learned it, I thought this is simply one of the best things I've ever seen. Oh, is it a kangaroo? Yeah, so oh, that's, that's great. Beautiful. And so I, I committed that to memory. So next time I see you, or you know, I'm around, I'll make people kangaroos. I just think oh, that's, that's gorgeous. <laughs> does he have a Joey, or does she have a Joey? No. You got to figure out how to make a little pocket. I have to do that. That's right. Yeah, I've been there twice, and we. The only time I've seen kangaroos is in Canberra. I've never yes, seen kangaroos yeah, anywhere like, but can Canberra. Yeah. I don't know. Are they all over? No, 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 they're not. You won't see one jumping down the street in Sydney, although it's technically possible. But you don't have to travel too far outside of Sydney that you'd probably find some kangaroos somewhere. What about around. the drop yeah. bears? Is that still a problem? No, we sent them all to California. <laughs> yeah, they're all on holiday. Drop bears, you guys, and hoop snakes. Uh, hoop snakes. And are hoop scary. snakes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, 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 they travel around. They bite their tail, and they and they roll on the streets like this. And then when they see a human being, they lunge at you and they, they grab you and they strangle you around the neck. Every day. Yeah. I've got hoops, snake insurance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, somebody, Rob says that he's last six, he saw a bunch last week. What are we talking, kangaroos? Or are we talking about hoop snakes or drop Hoop snakes. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have hoop. Drag, no, there are no, um, there are none here in California. I'm sorry. This is not there. Richard's got something for us. What do you want? Ah. Let me know when we're going to wrap up because you know what? We can all play dice game. Well, we can do game. that now. I guess it's probably a good time to do that. Let me see. Ruse. Yeah. So it's four. So yeah, probably a good time to wrap up. So let's do the all dice right. game. This is what, when you listen to the skeptic zone, which I hope everybody already does. And if you don't start subscribing to the skeptic zone and at the very, yeah, at the very end of the show, 
when he's done, stay listening because he always has a little outro for those people who just watch and, and you know, are, are into this. And one of the many things he does is he has this dice game. Now, Richard collects dice from all over the world and he gives them away to people, which is why he seems to have so many. He goes to Dragon Con or wherever. Uh, he went to New Mexico to see um, Finn Radford and we got some dice from, from New Mexico of aliens and, and things. Oh yeah, there's the alien one. So he does these dice games. And so since we're live, uh, anybody who's paying attention. Yes, we can play We can play in real time. So, folks, normally at the end of, of the Skeptic Zone, as Susan said, the music stops, it's all over, and I come back to it. Now it's time to play the dice game. Two I've got dice. a 10-sided die. And I'm going to... There. That's handy. I thought you used to do it and roll out onto the floor somewhere. And yeah, it's, it drops on the floor all it. the time. So this is your ch chance for the first time in real time. Oh, that's interesting. To Eight use your psychic zero. predicting power. It, or from your one to ten, luck. he's going to roll it three times. So what is the yep. first number? Um, so I I'm going to shake it now. I always guess now. five. It's gonna be you five. always guess five. And we'll see if... Uh, I'll Hurry up and time. type so it so before he rolls, you guys. Wait, 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 Richard, because there's a ten, ten second delay. So oh, hurry people, up. Are people are typing in their guess. Rob says, okay, Rob says zero. Sarah says three. Yeah. Amanda typing something instead of her number. Okay, six. Someone's bound to get it. What do you think? <laughs> I say it's five. Five. Okay, go ahead. Shall we go? All right, here we go. First one. First number. Linda Rosa says seven. Linda Rosa says seven. If I tip that, uh, can, there. Zero. Zero. Rob's got the first it's, one. Yeah, it's ten. ten. I mean, ten or zero. Yeah, it's, yeah, I understand. David says nine. Okay. All right. So Next wait, wait, one. Better, okay, so the second number, give everybody like 10, 15 seconds, just type it before you roll. <laughs> Hurry up, second number, you guys. One through 10. I say five. Shall we go? Okay, Rob says seven. Sarah says eight. Um, Hurry, you guys. Oh, Amanda says one. Linda Rosa says seven again. Lucky seven. Okay, David says this, for sure the second number is going to be five. For sure. Because that's what I said. Ready? All right, here we go. Here goes Linda. Susan? It's a it's five! five. <laughs> David, we score. <laughs> we rock. Carl, Carl with a K. One more. I, 3.14159. Okay, so you guys, one more. What are you guys going to guess? This is the third number. Give you 15 seconds to get that out there. Hurry up. Because remember, I'm saying it, and then it takes 15 minutes for me to tell them to hurry up and type yep. it. That's a good optical illusion. Is the spoon bending is the best optical illusion I know. Oh, yeah. You guys are looking at some a master yeah. of spoon bending right now. People really think it's bending. It's... Oh, what? <laughs> okay. I'm glad we got that on audio and video. So Rob is saying four. The third member, David, says it's five. I agree with Dave. It's going to be a five. Linda Rose is okay. three. Sarah says four. Amanda Lee says three. I'm going to write these down. Zero, five, and the la well, zero or ten, but we don't know. Okay, okay last one. Four. Are we ready? Are we ready? You guys ready? Here it comes. Hey, shake it, shake it, baby. Shake it, shake it. It's another five. Come on, five. Come on. Mama needs a new pair of shoes. Uh, eight. Eight, you guys. I don't think anybody got eight. <laughs> <laughs> got five. Yeah, hey, that's the best I've ever gotten. No, you actually, got one. I have had a five once before, but. Yeah. People. Normally every week, someone will write to me and say they've got at least two, and occasionally your people say, I've got all three this week. So that's quite good. Seriously? Really? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, thousands of people listening or thousands of people guessing, sometimes it's got to come up, right? That's why I'm guessing 555 five, five every time. Uh, you always guess 555. Five, 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 you know I was concentrating <laughs> on it. Of course, well, I, I did don't a, do it live with you very often, so. I did a 10-sided once. And it came up 10, 10, 10, I think. Oh, I can't remember. Something like that. 
That's funny. Well, all right. So I guess we'll end this. Thank you guys for uh, hanging out with us, especially to the end to the dice game, which is always so much fun. Um, I'd like to thank you, Richard. I really appreciate you doing this talk with us. It was so much fun. I thank you, Susan. With you. I mean, I see, I get to catch up with you every so often because we just will um, uh, yeah. type, uh, Look, talk together. But if people, want, if people want to really help, listen to my show, The Skeptic Zone. I do with all my reporters, skepticzone.tv. Uh, you'll see links to Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com slash skeptic zone. And that means a lot to me to have people listening and to my reporters who put in a lot of effort. Absolutely, you guys. Uh, to on, to make an entertaining <laughs> and, and educational show. But you know what, Susan? Mm. Now it's time for me to run downstairs. Run downstairs. Have a look. And I might have some M&Ms. <gasps> some ice cream. Plain. Some M&Ms. Some ice cream. <gasps> And some what we call in Australia bickies, Bicky. which are bis bickies, oh, biscuits, biscuits, cookies, <laughs> bickies. <laughs> so that's uh, that sounds pretty good to me. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. This will be up on YouTube, and I will put some links to some more amazing things. Make sure you subscribe and donate to uh, Skeptic Zone, and please thank you. share. Um, this feed and come back and check up on us and soon I wanted to plug really quick that Friday this Friday I will be speaking to Pontus from there's Randy Pontus from the uh, ESP podcast will be speaking to me on Friday my time at 11 o'clock uh, all the way over there in Sweden and this just in on Monday I'll be speaking to Michael Marshall from the UK skeptics Mr. Mr. UK and uh, on, yeah, on the 28th, that's Sunday, I will be personally be giving a lecture on GSOW to the uh, Florida Free Thought Group, and I'll be talking to them. And then Monday, the 29th, I'll be talking to Michael Marshall. And I'm happy to talk to other people, too, as well. If you guys would like to give a talk uh, in conversation with Susan Gerbic and About Time Presents, or if you know of somebody that you think I, I should be talking to, please let me know. Do the legwork for me and ask them first. And and then get back to me and say so-and-so would love to do a talk and, and I'll be happy to interview them. But thank you so much, Richard. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Susan.